it's so easy to point the finger in our world, right? It's so easy to point and be like, well, you know, if my principal would actually, if my department chair, if our governor, if our board, if our, if it, like that is so easy and it takes zero courage to do that. You know, it's a challenge for me. It's sometimes looking in the mirror and asking the same question. Like, well, how do you impact that, Tom? What can you actually do about that, Tom? Welcome back, everybody. This is another exciting episode of the Undisrupted Podcast. I almost forgot what I was going to say, Adam. <laughs> and it's because I mean, you've been traveling a little bit, though. So, you know, you're, I'm a little you're trying jet to get caught up. Yes. I am. Um, but it's also because after six seasons, I can't believe it's taken us six seasons to have this our guest on today. I'm not going to introduce him yet because first... I'm excited, but I, we got to do our opening debate first. And in our opening debate, since Adam, I know you're in the process of writing a book. Uh, I've written a couple. Um, question for you. Are you, when you write a book, do you just start with like a title and then fill it out? Or are you writing a book with a kind of a concept and then a title comes to you? Which way are you going? You know what? Here's the thing with that. I've vacillated on that. Um, because when I when I initially wanted to do a book, I was like, oh, this would be a great title. This would be a great title. But then as I started fleshing out what I wanted to do, the title didn't fit. Uh, so it, it's one of those things where once you really know what you want to say, the title in my mind kind of creates itself because it has to match what you want your audience to get from the, the work. You know, of course, if you want to grab everyone's attention when they see it, but it has to speak to the depth of the work that you've created. Um, now, that's someone who has not published yet thoughts and opinions. What about someone like you who have, I don't know, what, eight, nine? I mean, where are we at now? Seven. I'm at seven. seven. Um, it's a, it, well, the first six, it was kind of easy because honestly it was the title. Well, I'll be honest. I'll tell you all. So I was writing this book through ISTE and it was, I was going to call it the mobile learning manifesto and they thought that was way too harsh of a title. So they called it the mobile learning mindset. And at the time, uh, a friend of ours, mutual friend of ours, George Kuros had just come out with innovators mindset. And I was like, oh, I don't want another mindset book, but so they went with it. And so basically the first six books were all titled that with subtitles and then ready, set, fail was halfway written when I came up with that one. And it was like, oh, you know, that was funny. I was coming up with a proposal for ISTE and I wrote a conference proposal called Ready, Set, Fail. And I was like, oh, that could be the title of the book. And so that became the title of the book. Yeah, not much science going on here, but there is somebody who has written us several books as well. And he's our guest today. He's Tom Murray, Thomas C. Murray or C. Money, as I call him. Come on onto the stage, joining us finally after six seasons we have the boss man on with us. <laughs> don't, I know. Don't, don't, don't cancel the episode yet. <laughs> the first thing so I'm going to say is I'm still over here looking up in the dictionary vacillated that Adam pulled out of his back pocket. I think he, he makes and, up uh, words. I, I, I'm like, what? That word is way too big for this time in the morning for me is the first thought. <laughs> the second thought is it's only taken six seasons to get here. So you are officially out of the, the black book that you have, the Rolodex that you have, right? Like I'm the last one there. <laughs> All uh, right, pre- let's it's, pull the lever. It's such an honor. <laughs> It's such an honor to be the 702nd guest for you all. I really, it's, it is, I, that is deep meaning for me. So I appreciate that. I mean, it's almost the hundredth episode. No, I don't even know what we're on episode wise, but yeah. So, so Tom on the, but seriously on the opening topic, where did you fall on your books? Cause title comes to you and you just build it out. Or what are you doing? No, for me, it was knowing like I, I felt just doing so much work around the country with Future Ready and, and just other speaking. I just for both of them, Learning Transformed and for Personal and Authentic, I knew the direction and the story. So I just started writing. So if you're listening to this and you're you're hearing from these two and, and you want to get started, just get started. Right. So for me, I just started writing down the stories. I started writing down the topics. There was times I'd be sitting at a traffic light. Yes, I was safe. And I would just jot something in the notes, leave myself a voice text or a voice message. And then as the theme started to to develop, develop, I really wanted to get to the hone of like, what, what does this look like? And for both of them, for Learning Transformed, especially when you get to like the subtitle of it, that one's eight, eight, eight um, Learning Transformed, it's eight key ways to designing uh, tomorrow schools today. And then Personal and Authentic is designing learning experiences that impact a lifetime. So they certainly go hand in hand. But for me, it was really just getting started. And then like, where am I going with this? Who's the audience? What, what story do I want to tell? And that's that's one of those things that is so amazing at, that you have as a writer and also as a speaker to be able to have that voice. And 
it, it just comes naturally to you. Um, and I just want to compliment you on that. This is not, you know, just blowing smoke because, you know, you also uh, were the one who decided to go ahead and green light this podcast for Carl and myself. But, uh, <laughs> you know, now I see why I'm on Adam. Now I see why I'm here. He's pontificating. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yes. I mean, yeah. when I hear the no, title I, personal and authentic, I just think about you. I mean, it, you come across very personal and authentic in all the work that you do. I appreciate that. You know, and if I look at the title, Personal Authentic, for me, I almost actually just called it authentic, right? Like, I like the short, the sweet, easy to remember. But for me, it's how do I speak to uh, that one really written for anybody K-12, whether it's teacher, superintendent, but how do I speak to the impact of every single educator is different and that's okay. You know, at a time where we've tried to standardize everything across the board, recognizing the impact. So the analogy that I make for personal authentic throughout the book, because I'm sure that you two haven't um, actually read the book, is uh, the uh, fingerprints. No, I'm of still impact. waiting for my copy. <laughs> <laughs> you can buy it on Amazon. Go ahead and reach out today. So it's their <laughs> fingerprints of impact because, the you know, you make the analogy of fingerprints, every one of our fingerprints are different, right? They, they, they're personal. They're also authentic in nature. And so the connection that I wanted to make for educator is everybody's legacy, everybody's impact is different, but then the diversity in those differences between teachers through a system is really what makes the educational experience strong. So Adam, appreciate the shout out. One other thing though, I'll say for that, for people that are listening, maybe you're interested in writing or every educator that I know has incredible stories, incredible things, wisdom that they could put out. And I don't care if it's your first year, you've got reflections on your first year that next year's first year teachers could absolutely benefit from. And sometimes I think we deal with, and I, I struggle with this, so I'm, I'm going to say this and, and it's not something that comes easy to me, but it's like the perfection paralysis, right? As it's If it's not absolutely perfect, I'm not going to put it out. And maybe that's a piece of content. Maybe that's a blog. Maybe that's even a tweet, right? If it's just not perfect, I'm not going to put it out. And the funny piece that I'll make to that is there's things that I wrote in Learning Transformed and Personal and Authentic, and and shout out to Eric Scheninger for Learning Transformed as well as a co-author there. But there's parts I wrote to that when I was writing it, I'm thinking to myself, oh yeah, that was really good. And like nobody has ever commented on it, tweeted it, mentioned it, (laughs) nothing. Like never has it ever come up. But then there's parts that like I wrote it like three o'clock in the morning when I couldn't sleep and I was like, ah. And those are the things that get shared out or get tweeted out. So my point with that is don't be your own biggest critic and then create a wall to sharing your own brilliance. And whether it, maybe it's not in a book, maybe it's in a blog, maybe it's in a quick article, maybe it's just sharing some thoughts, maybe it's in a quick video reflection, like that perfect can be the enemy of getting your story out. And so just encouragement to those folks that are listening here. And with all that said, I still struggle with it. There's times I'll do like five takes because I said, um, one too many times or I pause and I'm like, what am I really doing? Be real and keep it real. Be vulnerable and just be authentic. Keep it keep it true to who you are. Well, that beard is real. For those of you that are watching the video version of this this uh, recording, um, that is that's that you have the the Tom Murray winter beard is in full effect, folks, uh, up in the in the burly woods of Pennsylvania. Um, yeah, so it's. I was trying to think back to the first time that you and I met. First of all, I have to say this too, and this is also not blowing smoke, but uh, I, I've not shared this. I don't know if we shared the story ever in a recording, but. Tom came and keynoted at my district once. Um, and it was, I made a, per, a point of not telling anybody that I knew him. I just, I is, you know, one of those things when you're a leader, you're like, you know, sometimes, oh, this is, this is so-and-so's guy. We're just gonna have to listen to this again, you know, whatever. And uh, even though I had a really good uh, culture there at that district, I was like, you know, I'm not gonna, I, I just wanna see what they think. So I invite him up on stage. He does this thing uh, and, and he, and he gets a standing ovation, which, to this day has never happened to Sir Ken. Well, I'll say Sir Ken Robinson got a partial standing. Uh, so you're close with Sir Ken. Um, but I mean, I'm talking people that have been on that stage with you. And it's it, to me, it was just phenomenal. Plus, I made a bet with them that they would never sing uh, <laughs> Living on a Prayer. I was like, those high school teachers will never sing that song. And if it wasn't the loudest scream I've ever heard when they're like, oh, you're halfway there. <laughs> anyway, so. I guess uh, this, can... <laughs> yeah. this brings us and, to and I'm gonna I'm gonna say that because the reason he just prefaced that is because if I was terrible, he would have been the first one to throw me under the bus to the entire <laughs> administrator. Be like, who made that decision yeah, to bring that clown in? So uh so yeah, no shout out. That was, that was say... a good time. And yeah, I only I pull that one out at convocations or large conferences to uh man, make them laugh, make them cry, but then push their thinking in between, right? So that, that culture is a big part of it too. And that's a big part of what your message is. And you talk a lot about it, 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 it throughout your books, throughout your talks. How does that, as a leader, 
like where does that fall on the line of like all the things that leaders have to deal with all the time? Because there's you know HR and financial. Blah, blah, blah. Where should culture be on the priority ladder of of a leader? Yeah. So I guess first and foremost, I'd have to put integrity, right? Like integrity, character, because as a leader without that, you've got nothing, right? And going along, that's going to be trust. But I would say a very close second, because I guess I'm looking at it as a leader for me as an individual, that 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 integrity, that that trust, that that is is paramount. Like, because with, without that, you're not going to have the culture that's needed. But underneath that, the, the culture to me is foundational to it all. When I get to speak, it doesn't matter if I'm working with superintendents or I'm working with support staff, I'm going to be focusing on that from the get go. Um, because there's so, it's so easy to point the finger in our world, right? It's so easy to point and be like, well, you know, if my principal would actually, if my department chair, if our governor, if our board, if our, if it, like, that is so easy and it takes zero courage to do that. You know, it's a challenge for me. It's sometimes looking in the mirror and asking the same question. Like, well, how do you impact that, Tom? What can you actually do about that, Tom? You know, there's times where I'll, I'll work with a district and, you know, somebody will pull me aside and they'll say, Tom, you know, I'm, I'm really glad you're talking about this today because my principal really needs to hear it. Right. I kind of always chuckle. And here's the thing. Like, I get toxic leadership. Like, I've I've seen it firsthand. I've worked, it is a very real thing. I'm not knocking that. But it's real easy for 50 people to point the finger at one. Like utopian as question, but if what if all 50 people made it the greatest place on earth to work in spite of the one, right? Like how can we don't ever look at it like that? And so for me, culture is the foundation of it all because it comes down to trust. So when you're talking about um, leaders, for me, it's also about modeling. And in personal and authentic, I often talk about like how many times I screwed that up. I, I made the commitment years ago, and I know you two are very, very similar where I'll, I'll never stand on a stage and tell people how well I did something. But I'll tell them how I screwed it up, right? Like I'll be vulnerable, I'll be real, because I think that sets the tone for other people to do the same. You know, when somebody stands on that stage or is leading a workshop and they're patting themselves on the back the whole time, it's so easy to take the mindset of like, well, if I had that principle, we could do that. If I was in that district, if it was a suburban district, if it was like you make every excuse why you can't, but when somebody's just real and vulnerable and willing to share their own failures and kind of why like your whole premise of your book, Carl, on on that, I think people just just keep it real. And so for me, when I think about leadership and I think about culture, we have to recognize, first of all, there's no perfect place because um, people worked there, right? And people can be pretty self-centered. People, be, And so, so with that, for me, it's how do you model that? Right. Leadership, the higher up you go, I believe, the more of ability, the more of um, the, the more opportunity, yet the more um, what's the word I'm looking for uh, obligation that it is to serve. Right. And so let me tell you just a quick example of a time like I screwed that up as a leader, because, again, it's real easy to say you've got to do this for professional learning. You've got to do this for assessment. You you know, you, you got to get back to parents in 24 hours, teachers. But like when you email me, I get a six week grace period. Right. Like and people see right through that. You know, and so I think for me, it's how do you model that? So I'll just give you an everyday example. Admin that are listening to this, how do you run a faculty meeting? How do you run an in-service day? Is it a direct reflection of what you're asking teachers to do in a classroom? Because it's real easy to say, hey, you got to differentiate for kids. You got to personalize for kids. Can't stand and deliver for 60 straight minutes. And then I just defined what I do at my faculty meeting. Right. And I get it. People are like, yeah, but like, yeah, but like you don't think teachers feel like they've got a lot of content they've got to work through. And so for me as, as leaders, how do you model the type of culture that you want? How do you model the type of behaviors that you want? Because behaviors truly are a language. And then in modeling that, how do you um, how do you also in the times that you do mess up because you're human, like it's going to happen. Those times where you stand in front of your staff and you say, you know, I, I made that decision two months ago and I appreciate all the feedback and it didn't work. I'm going to own that. And I appreciate the feedback and we're going to go in a different direction. And I want to want to keep that feedback coming because we want to get this right. Like in that moment, you also give teachers permission when that lesson falls apart, as good as they are, as experienced they are, it's going to happen to pick up the pieces and keep trying, right? To model perseverance to the kids. One of the things, final thought on that, that I'll say, like, even because it's culture related, um, I talk about, you know, uh, similar to your book, Carl, talk about failing forward, right? That fail forward mindset. You know, if our students in our classrooms look at that, our teachers as this perfect person that never makes mistakes, that knows it all, that knows every ounce to every content, to every standard, to every assessment, never makes any mistakes, like as lovingly as I can, they can't relate to you because they have no concept of what that feels like. But the same is true for admin. Like if your teachers look at you as this perfect person that had the perfect classroom when they taught and like knows every answer to everything, like they can't relate to you. But when you're human and you're real and you keep it authentic and you're vulnerable, people can relate to that. And all of those to me are keys to culture. Personal and authentic. Hmm. Cool. Yeah. Sounds good. Could be a good book title. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to shift gears. We're going to shift gears just a little bit. 
um, for this next question. You've been with um, Alfred for for a while now, so you've seen some administration changes in the White House. Um, we've gone from, I guess, regular school to uh, pandemic school to dealing with the pandemic school and all this stuff. A lot of things have changed. So with that being said, I know Alfred, Future Ready, they've kind of uh, changed some of the offerings that they've been able to now provide to schools. So if you can, just kind of share a little bit about, you know, where Alfred is going with some of these changes, some of the resources that they're going to be able to provide for schools. Because I know um, you've done some work with some cohorts um, and uh, just really would like for the listeners to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah, what a great question. First of all, I absolutely love working at Offred and getting to work alongside such great people. Bipartisan nonprofit, if you're not familiar with it, out of Washington, D.C. Check out all four, the number four, ed.org. On the policy side and then Future Ready is really the practice side. We're actually one of the very few organizations in the country that truly go from Congress to the classroom. There's times where colleagues of ours are, are working on the Hill, working alongside the Senate, the White House, the opportunity to do that occasionally. And then there's times we're working side by side with school and district leaders alongside folks like you that are, that are living it every single day. So um, one of the pieces coming up, um, uh, depending on when we, uh, we release this piece here as well, would be Digital Learning Day, just an opportunity to connect and get involved. And the reason I bring that up first is that's actually my original tie to All for Ed. Um, my team was highlighted when I was in a school district on the second annual Digital Learning Day. We had created our own full-time, <laughs> ready for this, full-time virtual program taught by our teachers with our content. You see in Pennsylvania, if students go to full-time online programs, the home district, you don't just lose the student funding. Pennsylvania, the districts have to pay for it to the tune of Fifteen to thirty thousand dollars. So any child with any sort of IEP it could be speech twenty times a year, cost the district thirty thousand dollars paying the tuition. So my superintendent uh, Lisa and Draco at the time had the vision to say, well, let's create our own program so they don't have a reason to leave. Obviously, if all these kids are leaving, we're not meeting their needs. And so shout out to her and her vision. Um, but that was highlighted on the second annual Digital Learning Day because we were one of the first districts in the, ma- in the nation. By the way, this is back in two thousand and nine to create our own virtual program taught by our teachers. And then my vision for that as I oversaw that program in district office was say at like our high schools, we were able to have this kind of open campus feel. Kids could come in for one or two periods a day, take the rest of the classes virtual. We were able to add students to it without crushing the budget because it was taught by our teachers. And then we actually started to make money as a district because we were teaching other districts and training them how to create their own programs. And so um, that was that was going back 12 or 13 years ago. So I share all that because that was actually my original title off red being highlighted on the second digital learning day. And so I encourage you to check that out. And sometimes, you know, every year when I'm sharing out about that, somebody will push back being like, we shouldn't just do digital on one day, you know, and like my cynical side wants to write back like, thanks, Captain Obvious, appreciate the tweet. Right. Right. But I don't because I'm not going to share that out. But it, that's not the, the point is to highlight the greatness that happens in classrooms across the country. And especially the pandemic has amplified a lot of that. It is not about being digital in nature. We know you can be 100 percent digital, 100 percent online and 100 percent low level learning. So that's one opportunity. But going back to Adam's question, you know, um, Future Ready does an incredible amount of work around professional learning. We were super high, excited to just hire uh, the one and only Dr. Adam File. So now being a colleague with this gentleman over here, um, he was the only one applied, the only person that I guess we could find to actually fill it. So um, <laughs> you know, just, I can't wait. Side by side with this guy right here is going to be awesome. Love the sound effects. Well said. So um, on a professional learning side, there's things to tap into literally every month. And we try to create create um, just this cycle of opportunity. You know, you all lead in some of the tech leaders work with some other incredible folks on the ground uh, doing stuff for, for high level leadership, whether it's principals, whether it's superintendents trying to do some of that. Our advisors play a key role in that. Adam, previously an advisor and, and Carl as well um, in some of those roles. So ongoing webinars, we'll try and do some case studies, we'll try and amplify great work that happens. We want to be the like, we gotcha, not the like, gotcha. We're not there to like do the unfunded mandate stuff out of DC and then tell you they're not doing it. That's not our goal. But to give people really also to eliminate some of the excuses, you know, sometimes in districts we're like, oh, well, we can never do that here. And then there's a district an hour away with far less enrollment, far less of a budget that's crushing it in that area. And so to give people the opportunity to see some of that. So we're putting that stuff out there. But then Adam alluded to one of the things we just started in this fall, and this actually grew organically out of Connecticut. I'll give Doug Casey. He is um, the Cedar rep in Connecticut, but he uh, oversees kind of the ed tech for the state. I'll give him the credit. He actually reached out 
out to us. We had a whole bunch of districts in Connecticut that were using the Future Ready framework, using the Future Ready dashboard, some of the assessments. And during COVID, they were saying, hey, like people were saying, hey, we're looking to create this plan. One of my biggest things keeping me up at night around technology is this fiscal cliff that's going to be coming in the next couple of years and districts that haven't really thought it out well when the funding then has to go to the local taxpayer and all of a sudden these vast increases for the things that we've purchased with ESSER funds, ARP funds, those kinds of things are going to come through. So they started to say, hey, we need a plan. We need a plan for sustainability. We need a vision for that. So a lot of them started to share, hey, have you checked out the Future Ready framework? Because this is not technology in isolation. And that's just one of the biggest issues we see where districts don't know, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing. The curriculum department's pointing at the tech department. The tech department's like, well, who purchased this on the, on the other side? And so we want to flatten some of that. And we've created, growing out of Connecticut, these cohorts. We limit them to a, a, just a, hand, a short number of districts, about 15 districts. We're not looking to be this massive undertaking, 15 districts at a shot. Um, and what we do is we pull together, we try to do this in-person event to kick it off. Um, and then about a six or seven month cohort. You see, everything Future Ready has always done has been grant funded up until this point. But realistically, and, and people have always understood this, like we can't do something that's going to have hard costs for seven months and a good amount of people's time completely for free. But we keep the uh, we keep the costs very basic, very low. But we've also find is when districts put a little bit of skin in the game, we're not talking massive amounts of money here by any means. When they put a little bit of skin in the game, what we have found is that, that everybody shows up every time and they feel like they really should. And so what's really cool is districts are then working for six or seven months to create a vision, a plan for sustainability around the research-based future ready framework. And then what's coming out of that is districts are able to say throughout that, hey, going to their board, hey, three years from now, we're going to have to start replacing a lot of the technology that's been given through these federal funds or that we've purchased. Here's our vision. Here's our plan. Here's how it's going to implement learning. Here, by the way, here's going to who's going to be accountable for it. And then this is our vision to make it happen. That is a very different conversation with school boards than, oh, hey, we need a three mil increase because we happen to need another $1.2 million, please. Right. Because you're basing it on evidence. You're, you're taking the time. And every time that that's happened, boards have said, thank you for the immense deep level work, visionary thinking to make sure that we're spending taxpayer money well. Right. At the end of the day, every dollar we spend comes out of somebody's pocket somewhere. We've got to do it well. So these cohorts encourage uh, encourage you to check them out. We're, we're launching. We're going to be starting a national one here in just a few weeks. Um, and that one is, pr is basically closed at this point just because, of the, again, we're limiting them, like we said. But if you want to check out more on that, you can go to futureready.org slash cohorts. We anticipate having a few in the fall, a few in the spring running simultaneously. And uh, they're also a lot of fun. You build relationships, connections and networks with people from districts throughout. We're going to be working with some states in particular, but then also some with some uh, just larger national ones there as well. And this uh, this podcast will come out in uh, late January. So it'll be like right during FETC uh, Digital Learning Day, which uh, Tom mentioned there also March 15th. Uh, and we have some things, possibly exciting things planned. Adam and I have been brainstorming some ideas for some fun stuff to do that day. Um, but yeah, that's uh, amazing work that, uh, of course, I've been involved with Future Ready for a long time. Tom pulled me in, I think 2016, 2015. Um, and just, uh, I've, uh, again, how much Adam, how much does it cost for the framework? It the, is the framework. It's last I checked, yeah, the, it's, it's, it's free 99. Yeah. Free ninety nine. Free ninety nine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so all those like the framework, the dashboard, a lot of those tools, we've we've worked really hard to get grant funding to be free. And you know, it's funny. Anytime you you say something like "here's free," everybody's skeptical. And here's the thing: like, I get it. Like, I get why people are skeptical. Like, what's this a big sales pitch for? Because we've all in leadership gone to this thing, and now we've got to listen to a three hour presentation just to get the free lunch, and we leave there being like, "Well, that's three hours of my life I can't back get back." We will never be that. We're not a sales pitch for anything by any means. We do have a bunch of partners that do great work, but they're not there to just sell their products. It's more thought leadership to be able to connect, but we're not there trying to sell people stuff. And so those that have gotten involved, gotten connected using the framework, using the tools, um, nobody's ever looked back saying like, I want my free money back that I didn't pay for, right? So we're continuing to add to that as well. Yeah. You know, one thing, and I want to I want to throw this uh, question out to you as well, because I know you've done a, a great job with this. Um, when, when we look at our space, uh, as far as our, our tech leaders go, our, our thought leaders, uh, sometimes it can become a vacuum. Sometimes it's the same people doing some of the same things. And I know uh, you've made it an effort to kind of go out and diversify the voices. You're like, hey, Adam, they don't need to hear from me. Um, you know, how about, you know, do you have anything to say here? Or do you know someone who'd be a good fit for this space? So I, for you, 
how important do you believe it is for leaders or people with the ability to do so to diversify the voices in the rooms to make sure that all voices are heard in, in, in this space, to make sure that we're meeting the needs of our students as we start talking more about this DEI work? Because we, we throw out that DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion a lot. But how important is it for people who can change the nature of the game to actually use their ability to change it? Yeah. So I, I'll be vulnerable and say, this is an area I think I've grown a lot. And I think I missed a lot of opportunity early on in my career and parts of throughout my career because I had my own blinders on. I mean, just being totally vulnerable in that regard. You know, when when you look at our world right now, look at our polit- or like the politics in our country right now, like everything is so jaded. Everything is so one side or the other. My challenge to myself and working in a bipartisan area um, in Washington, D.C., working sometimes with Republicans, sometimes with Democrats, like my, for me, it's learning to step back. And I almost look at it like, how do I want to teach my own children? Let me answer the question that way. How do I step back in these environments to say, okay, I know what I believe, but what I believe comes from my own personal experience, my own personal upbringing, but I've got to recognize there's so many people in our world that have a very different experience and upbringing. One of the things when I do get to do equity work um, across the country that I'll say is I will often share, I stand before you as a white male that grew up in suburban America, that grew up with all the foundations of everything that I needed. Right. I don't say that out of pride and ego. I didn't grow up in a wealthy household, but I had new clothes on the first day of school. I had, you know, what I needed. I had food at night. I wasn't worried about not having anything in the fridge. And so I share that out of vulnerability to say, I also have to recognize the vast amount and far more children in our country and educators I'm working alongside have a very different background and upbringing than me which means I have stuff to learn, which means there's times my mouth needs to be closed. So let me give you some examples of ways I've tried to do that just to give people ideas related to that. Um, When the whole Black Lives Matter hit, right? As a white male that you see on social media, all lives matter, like police lives matter, like all those things started to hit. For me, I stepped back. I went to two or three of my closest friends that are black males. And I said, help me understand. I don't know what it's like living like you in America every single day. I love you like a brother, but tell me, tell me about what you think. Help me understand. And I will tell you through some tears, through some own like self-reflection, just through things in my world, it changed me by asking people that had that trust. This is, was not a superficial like, oh yeah, Adam, hey, we've got some different, tell me about, and then never doing anything with it. For me, sometimes being quiet, letting them speak to me, like to, to my heart And then let me process, I've never looked at it like that. So for me, I share all that to try and model vulnerability to say like, that hasn't always been me. And so with that, some really practical pieces, you know, when I wrote Personal and Authentic, I recognize that's my lens. That's the way I see the world, but I've got to be real and recognize it doesn't make it right. Like it's right in my eyes, but it may not be right in the eyes of somebody else. And so there's over a hundred voices in Personal and Authentic that aren't mine. Some of them are these little make it stick, just little one idea, go to a kindergarten teacher. I think of you when I think of this area, give me one practical way. Why well, amplify the voices of other people? When I wrote the section on equity, I wrote it, wrote it alongside a good friend of mine, Ken Shelton. Recognize Ken's a black male from, um, he taught in LAUSD. We live on opposite sides of the country. We have very different um, upbringings in different ways, different life experiences. But I wanted to amplify his voice because he sees it differently than I did. And he's taught me a lot along the way. When I wrote the section on cultural relevance, I recognized like that is not my story to tell. Well, I set up some data, I launched it up and I opened it up to Dr. Rosa Perez Isaiah because her upbringing was very different coming into our country as somebody that did not speak English into a family um, that, that she would, you know, she shares openly about those pieces. That was not my story to tell. So to recognize leadership, sometimes you've got to pass the mic to other people to allow them to share out what it is and, and, and their viewpoints, because sometimes leadership is stepping back and being quiet. And I didn't always understand that to learn from others that have some of those key differences. So Adam, to answer your, your, your question directly, it's imperative. And I believe if you don't do it, you will fail because you're serving so many people that have incredible differences compared to you. And so every day is an opportunity to learn something from other people. You know, I'm not somebody that grew up on free and reduced lunch, yet how many kids did I serve? How many times did I, as a middle school assistant principal, have to have a conversation for a student that 
had a lunch bill that they weren't able to pay. And now I'm talking to a 12 year old on paying that lunch bill. I have to have the understanding. I have never been in that situation. And I don't say that out of pride or ego. I say that, did I have the empathy to step back to understand what would it be like coming to school, not having the money to pay for their sandwich and then having to talk about it? right? And how many times we put kids in that. So to me, empathy is huge here. And as leaders, look at your circle. I'll give you a quick activity that I'll sometimes do. If you're listening to this podcast right now, I want you to pull out your phone. I want you to look at the last 10 text messages you sent. Like, what do those people have in common? What are the differences? Because that'll show you part of your circle. And if you want to get better as a leader, The diversity in those lenses, the diversity in those experiences are what's going to make you stronger. Sitting in a vacuum, you're just going to get sucked up and you're not going to grow, right? And so doing that, I would encourage you, follow people on social media that see the world completely opposite than you. Follow people on social media, it may drive you a little nutty, that have completely different political views than you. Because sometimes they're like, nope, they don't believe me. If they love Trump, if they love Biden, I block them. All right, well, but now you're muting part of the world that's a reality of the people that you serve and you're not doing yourself justice. And so I would say learn from that, step back, be vulnerable, give the mic to other people, particularly those that have been oppressed or underserved in the past that haven't had the opportunity. Another way is an example I've tried really hard. I have a conference coming up, FETC is one coming up. I could have the main stage three or four times at three or four main sessions, or I can ask a colleague that's currently practicing as a principal, practicing as a superintendent. Why don't you join me in this? You want to do this together? You want to have a conversation with that together? Why? Because people will learn from that, from different lenses, different experiences, and they've got incredible talents. And if we're not maximizing those talents, that's on us. So- there's a, a couple things off the top of my head, but I'm just a couple. Yeah, uh, it's a lot. Head. It's a lot to unpack there. Um, I want to. Sounds wanna like wrap a new up. book. It does sound like a new book. It's a lot to unpack. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's a there's our three a three way collaboration right there. Um, <laughs> there's an interesting uh, you know there's a lot of different angles there that you were talking about, and one that I'm going to wrap up with this question, and it's because uh, you talked you know on the on the outset you were talking about diversity, equity, inclusion. And you talked about bringing in those extra voices. You talked about divisiveness. Um, we've, we haven't really touched on school boards gone wild, but that's kind of a part of this culture that we're heading in now. And as someone who works with leadership on the regular basis, like how do you keep yourself and also encourage leaders to keep themselves undisrupted when it comes to just, you know, self-care and, 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 and checking yourself because there's so much that you feel like you have to do it all the time. I feel like as a leader, like how do you encourage leaders and and maybe maybe some practices you do yourself to kind of turn things off? Like what's something you do uh, to help with that? And we'll wrap up with that. Yeah. First thing I'll say is I don't feel that I'm very good at it. It's something that I am constantly working on. Part of it comes for me personally, because I love what I do. I love who I get to interact with. I get to learn from incredible people across the country. So the nature and when you love what you do, or you have a servant heart like school and and district leaders have, is you go and you go and you go and you give until you've got nothing left. And then sometimes you go home and you have nothing left to give to those people that you love and that you care about the most. And so first, keep your priorities in order. You cannot lose your spouses, your children in this process because of the amount of time. There's always going to be something else to do. Number two, you truly have to set some boundaries. Uh, Recently, I've taken some social media off my phone. I've taken Facebook off my phone. I haven't looked at it in multiple months. I haven't looked at why because I found myself consumed with so many different types of media during my free time, consumed with so many different things that I'd look at my phone and now I'm looking at my email and I'm sitting next to my son that I haven't talked to in 20 minutes who's sitting on a device over there and some Sometimes there's this massive divide between us because we're both staring at something there as well. And so find really practical ways for me, removing some stuff off my phone because I I look at it and I glance at it. I find myself warped into it for multiple times, but then also finding ways to regularly recognize you can't feel guilty about putting it away and disconnecting. And sometimes that means that at four o'clock or five o'clock on that Friday, you're going to say, I'm not bringing my device home this weekend. I've been here at school all week long. I'm disconnecting. It'll be here on Monday. My wife, my my family, they need me this weekend. I'm going to invest in them. And you can't feel guilty about that. Having a servant heart does not mean you run over yourself in this process because you are no good when you're face first against the floor. Leaders, my other piece to that, how do you model that? to your staff because it's real easy to say to your teachers, you need to take care of yourself. And then you're emailing them about what you need all weekend long. You need to model (laughs) what you're expecting for them and show them it is okay. And it is needed to disconnect as a human being. You need to take care of yourself. You're so busy taking care of everybody else. Got to take care of yourself in the process as well. 
Well, uh, let's hope that it's not 137 more episodes until we have Tom on again. Uh, Tom, thank you for joining us. You can follow him on Twitter at Thomas C. Murray. Of course, all the great work at all for ed all the number 4 edorg uh, Future Ready Schools. Digital Learning Day coming up March 15th. Tom, we'll see you. Uh, probably when this goes live, we'll probably actually be in the same space. Uh, all of us in New Orleans, which will be kind of fun. So thank you for joining us. And for the listeners out there, of course, be sure to subscribe and give us a review. We'd appreciate it. We might even give you a shout out on a future show. This has been the Undisrupted Podcast brought to you by All for Ed. He's Adam, and you can follow him at Ask Adam 3 And he's Carl, and you can follow him at Mr. Hooker. And remember, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls of all ages, we are better together. And we are better. Undisrupted. Undisrupted.